And welcome to the Civic Caucus Friday interview. It's Friday, March 26, 2021, and I'm Janice Clay, Chair of the Civic Caucus, dedicated to nonpartisan debate and discussion of issues important to Minnesota. Today, we will again be focusing on a very important and timely topic in Minneapolis, the long-running policing issues faced by the city. We're honored today to be joined by a person extraordinarily well-qualified to speak on the subject, former Minneapolis Police Chief, Tony Boza. Paul Ostro will introduce Chief Boza and also moderate the discussion. Also here today are members of the Civic Caucus interview group. On behalf of everyone, I want to express our deep thanks to Chief Boza for joining us. And I'll now turn the discussion over to Paul. Uh, thank you, Janice. And yes, it is a very much uh, an honor and a pleasure to have with us today uh, Tony Boza, uh, a distinguished uh, public servant of many, many years. Uh, uh, Tony was born in Spain uh, and uh, moved to this country uh, when he was uh, nine years old uh, and started his career in law enforcement uh, in the New York Police Department, uh, serving that department from 1953 until 1976. Um, his final position with NYPD uh, was as an assistant chief uh, and the commander of, of the Bronx. Uh, he went on from that position to be the deputy chief of the New York Transit Police. Uh, and when Mayor Don Fraser was elected, um, uh, shortly after he was elected uh, in 1980 as mayor of Minneapolis, uh, Chief Boza was tapped by Don Fraser to be a police chief uh, and served three full three-year terms, uh, served for nine years as the chief of police uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, uh, since that time, he has also had a position uh, as the head of the Minnesota Gaming Association. Uh, and uh, and it had, after his retirement, has been a prolific writer uh, and uh, speaker and expert on the issues of police accountability, uh, the necessity of police reform, uh, and the police culture. He has written nine books on that topic uh, and is a frequent contributor to the Southside Pride. Uh, and again, we are so glad to have you with us. Uh, uh, you asked us to call you, Tony, so that's what we will do. Uh, Tony, we look forward to some introductory comments and a very vigorous conversation with you today. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let me just say parenthetically that your lecture was a breath of fresh air. I remember it very well and you served uh, wonderfully. Uh, so thank you for your service. Uh, my, my perspective is formed by the fact that I was an impoverished immigrant. Uh, I arrived in America at the age of nine, as you said. My father was a stoker and we struggled uh, uh, terribly with poverty. And the country educated me and enriched me and lifted me up. And I uh, felt that I had to give something back somehow. And I tried to do that uh, through police reform, making police a better institution. So I devoted my life from 1953 to this moment uh, to trying to make the police more responsive to our wonderful democracy and, and to try to analyze the problems. I think my selection in 1979 uh, here in Minneapolis to be chief was illustrative of the kind of issues that uh, remain to dog the police department to this day. Uh, power of the union, uh, racism. America faces two great problems, racism and unequal distribution of income too much of a disparity between rich and poor. Uh, uh, today, thanks to events like the George Floyd case, we are beginning to address the issue of racism in America. But it wasn't George Floyd who was the hero, uh, in my judgment. It was Colin Kaepernick, the man who knelt uh, during the... Uh, the uh, singing of the Star Spangled Banner and lost his job and, and ruined his career in the process. 
he, that Colin Kaepernick is the true hero of the racist struggle. Now, internally, the dynamic in the police department here and elsewhere, so I, uh, it applies as much to uh, Minneapolis as it does to anywhere. Uh, it's not going to be mechanistic or formulaic. Uh, the reforming the, the, or the man, manipulating the city charter isn't going to get you one inch further. Uh, New York has a very strong mayor system, and it is utterly screwed up. Uh, you have a police commissioner who is weak and ineffectual. You have a union whose president spoke at, at uh, Donald Trump's uh, nomination for the presidency. Pat Lynch, you should remember that speech because they, they reached the police union reached the apotheosis of political power in America in that moment. So what are the problems in policing? The problems are very like uh, they were in 1979 in Minneapolis. If you recall in this around 1970, the president of the police union was elected mayor with, uh, with, with fateful consequences uh, for the city. Charles Stenbig launched the worst spoil system in American policing history. And uh, he, uh, appointed as cronies police chiefs, one of which the worst has just died, Gordy Johnson, uh, and the others, the other two were no better. So what is the problem in American policing today? Uh, the problem is no nothing mayors who have uh, no sense of uh, uh, of crisis and no particular interest in, in making a careful selection or search for a police chief. You have you, police unions that are enormously powerful with big uh, treasuries. They wander the halls of uh, legislative, legislative halls. Uh, they produce uh, legislation, uh, civil service laws, uh, that are very, very uh, strict and tough. Uh, they make it very difficult for uh, uh, you to discipline or fire. So you have the police unions whose principal task today is to defend thumpers. Uh, in the paper here by Mr. McClure, he calls them warriors. I don't call them warriors. That's an altogether too noble. Uh, <laughs> I prefer the cartoonish uh, thumper. They're thumpers, uh, they, and they like to beat blacks, uh, and they are the instruments of racism in America. In the George Floyd case, we have a wonderful uh, symbolic example of the problem. Uh, the victim, George Floyd, not a hero, not an angel, uh, in no sense a perfect human being. I would have picked Colin Kaepernick, but you don't get to pick uh, uh, the, uh, the heroes. Uh, so George Floyd was, did not come into that issue innocently. He, he was committing a crime. He had drugs in his system. And he was very likely, I would suspect the uh, trial will show, uh, not totally cooperative but he was still the victim of racism, but he was not murdered. He was killed. Uh, uh, Chauvin, the officer involved, who is a thumper in my judgment, and uh, killed him inadvertently. He was trying to teach him a lesson and put him in his place. And, and uh, George, uh, he, he was too, uh, altogether too tough and rough about it and wound up uh, killing uh, uh, George Floyd. That is manslaughter. That is not murder. That is different, a different crime. And we've got to be mercilessly truthful and accurate in assessing these issues. Otherwise, well, we become Donald Trump all over again. We're twisting the truth to our, our uh, uh, convenience and and uh, and never getting at the real problem. 
So the reality is that in this case, you have a thumpa. A thumpa is the person who leads the charge, kicks in the door, is the first one through a, a hail of bullets, a hero, chest full of medals, racist. They set the tone in the police departments. They represent two to three percent of the police force everywhere in America. They set the tone. When they speak, people listen. They have a chest full of medals. They, they set the culture. The others, these are the meat eaters, the alpha males, thumpers. Now the rest are just grazers in the field. They go along and they get along. Can the thumpers be controlled? Yes. You need a determined chief and to take on the union because the union's principal task is to protect the thumpers. That's what how they make their, their bones with the police department. <clears throat> By, it isn't a recruiting problem. I don't even see it as a training problem. We can train them better, but the recruitment process is a wonderful filtration. It isn't easy to become a cop in America. That's one of the uh, bromides that needs to be addressed. It's hard to become a cop in America. You have to be very focused. Policing pays very well. It has wonderful benefits and it has a, a, a wonderful, a tremendous pension. It's a very, very desirable job. Nobody quits. If you ask a cop today, anywhere in America, man or woman, this is what they would say. The job sucks. The chief is a psycho. We're going to hell in a handbasket. Morale has never been lower. All of that is bullshit meant to go and deceive the public. They love what they do. No one ever quits. And when you try to fire them, you have a great problem. Now, in the Floyd case, we have Floyd symbolically hero the hero in the case i don't see him i see him as a flawed hero victim of racism to be sure the uh, the officer responsible for his death alpha male thumper the other three grazers in the field they were fired without legal process the four cops were deprived of their rights and fired, in my opinion, illegally. And I think they're going to visit a humiliation on the city when some reluctant arbitrator has to restore them to duty. Then they will be convicted, in my judgment, and then they will be fired legitimately. Firing cops is not as easy as the mayor in this city made it look and the police chief. That was a terrible tactical blunder on their part. The reality is that the mayor has no interest in police reform. Uh, <laughs> I, I've met the man. He has no curiosity, no interest. He is not driven, or wasn't until now, driven by any particular crisis, as Fraser was. And he was perfectly content to hire a, a caretaker. The police chief with whom I have met, the police chief is a wonderful man, charming, delightful, intelligent, courteous, respectful. He's a loser, too bad. He doesn't want to take on the union. He happens to be black, but that's another mistake we make. The police chief of Minneapolis is not black. He's blue, and there's a huge difference. <laughs> he, is a, he is a product of the culture. When I met with him, I've only met him once, I said, look, you are management, the union is labor, is an adversarial relationship. I hate to say this, but you have to fight the union. The union is not engaged in a noble enterprise of trying to ben increase benefits or wages. That's over. What they are doing now is protecting 
thumpers, and then they put the the just the outgoing president of the union, uh, Bob Crow. You have a perfect example of of the type: a motorcyclist, leather jacket, uh, loves Trump, uh, uh, and, and is a, is a raging apologist for for thumpers. That's what the, the reality is. So. Is reform possible? Yes. Uh, you have to develop a sense of crisis. You have to make uh, selections. But there are very, very few re police reformers in America. I would defy anyone to point out a police chief in America anywhere that you would define as a reformer, the type that, uh, that uh, served in New York City from 1970 to 1973, a fellow named Patrick Murphy, 30 months, the only police reformer I ever encountered, the only one. And he is a pariah today, his memory is a, as a pariah and is widely uh, scorned within the ranks. The police unions are in charge. They have gotten all the benefits and wages they're going to get. Their principal function today is to protect and preserve thumpers. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the Floyd case is a wonderful example. I think, although charging them with murder was really silly, because murder is the intentional killing of a human being by another, and they were not intentionally, uh, uh, George Floyd was not intentionally killed. He was being disciplined. The, he, was put, he was being put in his place. He was being punished for being black. That's the reality. The, the, the death was an inadvertence, as these things often are, but they reflect the culture and the culture is shaped by the, by the police union and reform in America is not going to happen until, until we have a full-fledged and knowing debate on the issue, just as we are having a debate now, launched by Floyd, Black Lives Matter has launched a debate about racism in America and the, and the role of the police. The police in America have been the instruments of white society and controlling black citizens. That's been their role. The police in America have been largely an army of occupation that is there to keep blacks under control. Blacks are kept down, they're deprived of education, deprived of jobs. They are not able to participate fully in American democracy and capitalism. The police department is socialism. America is capitalist. If you were the president of a corporation and you were not producing, you'd be fired. And they would undertake a search for somebody who would do the job. But if you are the, president, the chief of police, you don't get fired. You just have to get along and go along. So the reality is that American policing is in a terrible crisis occasioned by racism, occasioned by an unwillingness to, to uh, reform. And it probably represents the last remaining vestiges of white control in America. The history of blacks in America, they arrived as in the first slave ship, August 1619, over 400 years ago. They experienced slavery from 1619 to 1865. After slavery came J Jim's, Jim Crow, 1865 to 1965. From 1965 onward, some piddling progress, but mostly characterized by incarceration. So the problem is racism, and income inequality and white supremacy. And until we begin to really address that issue, and we're making progress, I don't want to denigrate the, 
if we look, you look at television today, you see progress. Uh, we are making progress, not fast enough. Ask any black person, is this a racist society? And uh, the, the honest answer is gonna be, to some degree it is. Now there are some institutions that are doing better than others. Policing is not one of them. This Ivy League is. The Ivy League is making a genuine effort to recruit blacks into the uh, superior elitist educational system in America. Otherwise, it's a bit a grim scene. So uh, I am not particularly sanguine. I don't think, uh, I think we are making progress. We're beginning to address the issue. Uh, but uh, look at the policing. Uh, there's no debate about the choice of police chiefs. Can the police be controlled? Absolutely. It's a dictatorship. So the only real question is, what does the dictator do, man or woman? Is he in charge? Is he doing the right thing? I mean, government matters. Who's in charge matters. Singapore has been very well led and ruled because of a Harvard-educated character named Lee Kuan Yew, who uh, established a very sensible system of government. Well, it can be done. The police can be controlled. Pat Murphy proved it. Others could. I hope I did. I, don't, I would not say so. But uh, the reality is America is in trouble. Defunding the police is not the answer. But, but managing the police better is one-person patrols, aggressive police tactics. The police should be aggressive within the Constitution. Our founding fathers were not liberal wimps uh, who, who didn't want law and order. They do. And I just will conclude, and I'm sorry for the length of all this, by saying that the most important institution in America is a free and untrammeled press. The New York Times being the best example. So when people say that the American press is the enemy of the people, they are really saying, I am the enemy of the people. Because anyone who attacks a free and untrammeled press is a, a, an enemy of the people and against the democracy. And of all of the press, uh, I would say the New York Times is preeminent. So I consider it the most important institution in America. And I'll just end by saying that um, the greatest living American is Bill Gates. I thought you'd want to know my opinion on that. That's it, folks. As uh, the cartoonish character said, the dip, the dip, the dip. that's it, folks. That's all. <laughs> wow. Tony, you've given us an awful lot to digest, and we appreciate that. Uh, while others are jumping in, and I don't see them yet, but I'm sure they will, how is it that 3% of a police department can dictate the culture of the other 97%? That, that's a very good question, Paul. I'll tell you, look at the uh, George Floyd case. Who is the leader? Who is the uh, alpha male? Who is the aggressor? When he talks, people listen. Who's got all the medals? Who did, uh, who's got the, the great record? When in a group of cops, that's the guy they're gonna listen to. The four cops respond, one takes the lead. Over and over again, that scene is repeated. So they set the tone. That's, uh, they're the real leaders. They have uh, tremendous energy. They have courage. They're heroic. They're racist. They're heroic. Uh, we, you know, we tend to be rather simplistic in America. We think our heroes are noble. They're not all noble. Heroic figures can be aggressive and and in the in the and used to evil purposes. They can be, but they're they're characterized by bravery, by heroism. And we make a terrible mistake by mistaking it for uh, nobility or democratic impulse. 
Thank you, Tony. We've got a question from uh, Walt McClure and then uh, Lee Munich. Uh, I have uh, three uh, things. One is there is a police chief who did an exceptional job of reform in Camden. Unfortunately, he's now retired and it remains to be seen whether what he did can stay, but that's J. Scott Thompson. And in a longer paper that I've written, I record those things if, if you would be interested. Uh, uh, there is, well, the second thing is, uh, how does a chief have responsibility if the system keeps putting bad cops back? They don't have to pay attention to the chief. He can't, he can't fire them because they come back with the arbitration system, the prosecutors, the, the, I don't know what all it is, fair labor laws and so on. That's why I'm saying if we have step one, which is we need to change from the thumper approach, as you call it, uh, to this procedural justice plus de-escalation and making sure everybody comes back safe, including the suspects and purpose. Uh, uh, and Camden illustrates that can be done and how successful it is. Crime fell, solved crime rose, the de-escalation of violence was amazing and the community trust that that produced from a total hostility is amazing. People started talking to the police again and so they could actually prevent and solve crime. Uh, so we know a good policing approach. What we don't know is how can we restore enough authority to a chief that he can get rid of officers who are insubordinate to the policy? Question. And I don't know what- Tony, what's, your, uh, what's your response to that? Well, uh, I'm, a, I'm familiar with Camden and it has a good reputation and uh, that's wonderful. It's not a, a huge town. Uh, let's see, what do the unions do? The unions have a lot of money. They wander the legislative halls. They get civil service laws passed that, uh, that uh, make it very, very difficult to fire cops. Tenure, uh, uh, but a, a kind of a supercharged tenure on steroids. <laughs> uh, so they, uh, they, uh, they, they, if you find it very difficult to fire cops, civil service reform, uh, police union endorsements. Uh, look at, uh, look, look at the, uh, in Minneapolis, look at the prosecution in, uh, the, uh, Justine Damon case, Noah, we all know the case nor was convicted after a very tortured situation. Well, he had an accomplice. He was never prosecuted. Did the union, did the union endorse the prosecutor? Uh, the, uh, did the uh, prosecutors wander the legislative halls? The reality is that the union is endorsing political candidates. They know how to play the, the most important game in America without question is politics. That's where the power is. And they know how to play that game. They want the, the legislative halls. Uh, they influence the choice of police chiefs. But much more importantly, they pass legislation. They appoint arbitrators. They uh, pass legislation and civil service laws that lock cops into place and Mr. McClure is absolutely right. It's very, very difficult to fire them. And even if you manage it, they get restored. Uh, I've, that's a struggle I've had all my life. But police departments can be controlled. The police chief has one tool that is very, very important. And I would say used mercilessly, internal affairs. You appoint as internal affairs uh, commander, 
a promising, talented executive, police executive, male or female, that will hold them accountable, that will promote transparency and truth. When I arrived in Minneapolis, uh, cops were uh, stopping black motorists right and left indiscriminately. I issued a simple order. From now on, you can stop all the blacks you want, all, uh, all the cars you want, actually. All you need is to write a report in every instance and describe articulable grounds and probable cause. That's all. And then you can stop all the blacks you want. You know what? The stopping, the indiscriminate stopping of black motorists stopped immediately because they knew that I would just say, well, where's the report? And what were the articulable grounds and the probable cause? And if you have them, speeding, weaving, dangerous uh, lights out, whatever, fine. But if you didn't have probable cause, or if you didn't submit a report, you got disciplined. They're not, it's not that difficult to control the police. You have a tool, internal affairs, and you're the dictator. Even if you can't fire them, you can discipline them, you can humiliate them, and you can, and you can demonstrate to the motions, promotions, shifts, and assignments, you're in control. And I don't think that for nine years that I was there, that anybody had any doubts as to who was in control. I was determined to be in charge, and I was a dictator, and I ruled by fear, but I ruled. Lee. Pretty good. What are your thoughts about bringing in social workers, mental health professionals, other healthcare um, <laughs> visuals uh, to replace uh, police on many of these calls where, um, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, that could maybe reduce the, uh, the influence of the police in, in some of these uh, situations? I think that anything that promotes accountability, uh, response, responsibility, intellectual growth, uh, uh, deeper understanding of the dynamics has to be embraced and welcomed. The role of the scholar and the artist is a critical one in, in policing and in everything else. Uh, the so we must open up the police uh, to other uh, to, 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 uh, to new uh, initiatives. You know, when I arrived in Minneapolis, I, I said, this is 1980, I said, we're going to have uh, 911 here. And, and everybody said, well, what is it? Now, it was invented in 1967. This is 1980. 13 years later, what is it? I said, the day will come when no one in Minnesota will say, what is it? Nine one, but it took three years. So the reality is that it's not that easy, but you've got to welcome innovation. You've got to welcome intrusion. It's a very, policing is a very hermetically sealed uh, institution. I, in 1975, wrote an article that brought women into policing. It was called Women in Policing, an Idea Whose Time Has Come, and it was published in the uh, FBI Bulletin, a national magazine. And the, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center said, would you be willing to testify that women can be cops? I said, absolutely. I went all over the country, testified everywhere. Every obstacle to women in policing was demolished. That revolution is over. That was 1975, and now 46 years later, that revolution is won and nobody talks about it. How come? It used to be a big question. Well, the treatment of blacks has got to be the same thing. We can get to the day when racism will be eliminated in police behavior. I don't know about attitudes. I don't know how to change attitudes but I know how to change behavior. 
and you what you do is reward and punish. And if you have to rule by fear, you rule by fear. Hmm. Clarence. We recently had a uh, guest who uh, has done some work for the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, and uh, his observation when pushed about how do you get change in the uh, police department? Uh, his conclusion was that you lack the political support to fundamentally get that done. And if you don't get the political support, all the other kinds of moving around uh, chairs on the deck and all the other kinds of things you want to talk about are not going to affect the kind of change that you're talking about. What's your observation about that conclusion? Uh, I, I missed your central point. What was the central point? That you need to get political support to make any kind of fundamental change <clears throat> to the police department, because without it, okay, nothing that's, a very, that's a wonderful question and, and totally central to our discussion. When I arrived in Minneapolis in 1980, I knew that I had to choose a constituency for support. And there were basically uh, uh, three constituencies that I could choose. One would be the mayor, uh, to please the mayor. That's the New York model. Two would be to throw in with the union and become a hero to the cops. Or three, and this is around amorphous and, and abstruse and very difficult to grasp, the people. The people, the person standing next to you in the lungs, nudging you and saying, hey, that chief is a, a real schmuck, isn't he? I mean, he's really, that's what I wanted. I wanted to, uh, to convince the people. So how do you do that? Well, you tell the truth. Uh, you, you communicate with the people. An event like uh, Floyd occurs, you tell the people the truth. Uh, Floyd is not some Vestal Virgin who was engaged, who was cut down in the, in the midst of prayers in the cathedral as uh, Thomas Beckett. Uh, the cops uh, were not evil. They were sent there by, they were summoned by somebody who was being thrust a, 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 a counterfeit bill. We have to understand the complexities. And the overall issue is, it was racism, there was a thumper, there were three grazers watching. So you, uh, is, it, is reform possible? Yes, it is possible. But you've got to have control. I chose the people as my constituency and the press as a vehicle. I had a totally open system. Let's just look at this today. Today you have a press information officer. I would never hire a press information officer. You have a bloated bureaucracy. You have feather bedding. You, have, uh, you don't have one person patrols. You can double the number of calls you can respond to by having one person patrols. You have a bloated bureaucracy. They're not working eight hour days. They're not working 40 hour weeks. They have tremendous benefits, large salaries, and they're not held accountable for performance. All of that is political. And, and where it works, politics works. Policing is socialism. America is capitalism. In capitalism, you hire, you fire, you look at the bottom line, you measure results. What do police departments do? They do only three things. They deal with street crime, they respond to 911 calls, and they regulate traffic. That's what they do. That can be measured. And if they don't perform, uh, you, you get someone else to do it. It's a bloated bureaucracy full of superannuated supernumeraries. And the reality is that nobody gives a goddamn. So, Tony, I'm going to jump in again if I can, because it seems to me, and I, I try to ask a question quick because I don't want to make this a speech, but we elect mayors and council members. We don't elect police chiefs. We certainly don't elect union chiefs. Um, and it seems as though 
the mayor and council have almost been able to absolve themselves of responsibility. Uh, it's the legislature, it's the power of the unions. Uh, we're without any we're, we're without any ability to change this. Um, and they've succeeded, in my opinion. The vast majority of Minneapolis residents, I think, are convinced that this is just somehow beyond their control. Um, so how do we return accountability to the elected officials? So if I'm voting in an election, I know I can hold that mayor, that city council accountable for the behavior of my police department, because right now it doesn't seem we have that. You know, in 1979, Alfred Hopstead, a relatively young man, said, I will not run for re-election because I cannot control the police. They're out of control. Donald Fraser said, I will undertake a nationwide search, expend resources, devote energy, and concentrate on the problem and resolve it. That's the model. I mean, uh, the fact that it resulted in me is a little grandiose and self-congratulatory uh, self and bullshit. But uh, the reality is that it can be done, but you, ne you need to prioritize. Why doesn't America resolve its racism problem? Well, because it's perfectly comfortable being a racist society, but it is moving in the right direction at last. Uh, but but it, look what it has taken, 400 years. That, and that's the characteristic of a democracy. It is the worst system of government, except for all the others that have been tried. Uh, that's, that's the reality. I love the democracy. I, you know, I grew up in Spain, and we had Franco. Uh, Franco was not Hitler, but he was no bargain. So uh, we've got to struggle with it. The, the great characteristic of a democracy is struggle. It's torture. And just as with human development, introspection, questioning, torture, search. That's what it, uh, Minneapolis faced in 1979. Since then, they don't give a goddamn because they've gone on to other things. And until their noses are pressed hard against the grindstone, it ain't gonna happen. So thank you, Tony. I see Pat, you would like to ask a question and Dana, you would like to ask a question. Uh, so Pat and then Dana. <laughs> you, did, you did talk a little bit about my, um, what my question was gonna be premised on and that is that I, Fraser was a great mayor. Uh, every, but he liked him. And one of the reasons was because you were his police chief. I think that that was a, a good relationship that, that people understood. Um, if a mayor were running now, which they a lot of people are, um, does that mean that you have to abandon Arondo? Uh, it, how, how does that- Abandon work? what? The um, current uh, police chief. What do you think of the, what, you know, what, what do we do with the current police chief if you're running as a mayorality candidate saying, I'm going to do a nationwide search? That is a great question. Uh, that, and that, Fraser was a, an unusual character. How does America solve its problems, whatever they may be, whether it's policing, economic, social, whatever, political, how does it solve its problems? You know, there's a simple answer, debate. Ah. Debate, torture. What are we in the middle of today? A debate on race, that's what, that's the way we solve our problems. Debate, torture, discussion. I'm, I stand for this. I, no, I stand for that. No, you're wrong. No, we've got to do this. Is uh, the life of Blacks in America a real problem? Well, I think America would, have, would love to have avoided that question. Well, now we're not avoiding it. And then we're tortured and struggling with it. That's the way you solve every problem in a democracy.
torture, debate, discussion. People lose elections, win elections, get thrown out. People get arrested, people get shot, people get killed. Look at gun control. We're going to have to lose a lot of people before we start talking sensibly about gun control in America. We have a, pro a proliferation of firearms. It's crazy. So, um, you know, uh, the right likes to kill adults and the left likes to kill babies. Abortion, capital punishment. That, that, you know, it's, the, it's about debating. So the question is a great one. How do we resolve the problem? We must debate it. We must plunge into it, get into the mud and wrestle with it. Okay. I have uh, Dana and then I have Clarence. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm so prolix. I'll try to make my answer. No, 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 you're, you're, you know, keep, keep right on going. Dana and then Clarence. <laughs> you're too kind, Paul. Uh, yeah, the charter reform, city charter reform is going to be a big issue in the upcoming election. Do you think, um, you know, the city council has one where they want to put themselves in charge of the public safety um, role and the uh, Charter Commission has one where they'd like to give more executive power to the mayor and make the city councils want a legislative role. And then there's people who want to abolish the police department. Do you think, uh, for example, the Charter Commission wanting to give more power to the mayor over department heads, including the police, do you think any of these city charter amendments would work to help reform the police department? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. There are two things. Uh, charter reform is, you know, I love the English language. It's a chimera. It is a mirage in the desert. Charter reform, I don't see as leading anywhere. There are two institutions that liberals are drawn to. Uh, that uh, they, they think possess magical powers. <laughs> the really review boards and <laughs> charter reform. They're mirages. There isn't a single review, civilian review board anywhere in America that has ever done a single useful thing. <laughs> that has not been co-opted, not been urinated all over. Uh, the police unions urinate on civilian review boards and tell them it's raining, and these people are putting on raincoats and opening umbrellas. That's what it's about. So civilian review boards, charter reform, I must confess to some skepticism. Thank you. Is that a clear enough answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do try to waffle what I can. <laughs> Oh, Clarence. Can, can we interrupt just briefly, Tony, Tony to further oh, Paul, go ahead. have you comment on that? What about the city council becoming more involved by the charter amendment in the police? Is that a good thing then to have happen? <laughs> the only thing that moves American politicians is crisis. That's what moves them. I think we are beginning to develop a sense of crisis about American policing, and that's altogether a good thing, mm -hmm. because it will generate a debate out of which genuine reform and reformers will, will arise. So uh, the debate is a good one, but um, look, it's about management. I could tell you 10 things that the, uh, any police department can do. New York has a strong mayor system and a screwed up police agency, totally screwed up. And, and the union is in charge and the police chief and the mayor at, are at odds and the mayor doesn't know what to do uh, about running it. And he's married to a black woman. So you would think he would understand the, uh, the issues and the problems. Uh, uh, so you, in New York, you have a wonderful model. You have a, a, a terrific mayor, very bright, 
white guy, married to a black woman, two wonderful children. He knows nothing about policing and has never moved an inch. And he's been there seven years. He, 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 and, and his predecessors, Giuliani had, Giuliani, wonderful figure, not America's greatest person. <laughs> the police commissioner went to prison. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And that's okay. the kind of guy wow. Giuliani is, really clever. Paul, when you get a chance, yeah, yeah, jump on in. We're, we're using the technical system here, and I don't want to leave anybody out that's not using it. So uh, uh, jump ahead, Ted. For a day. <laughs> this is end. It, it's, it does seem to me. we got 20 more minutes, uh, Tony, if you can last for us. Does this end with my death? Is that where we are? <laughs> that's, you know, this is so good. I think we're just going to keep it going for as long as you can. Right. Oh, it is. Yeah, no, no, no. We're, we're, we're going for another I'm 20 all, minutes I'm or so. I'm enough now that I can probably die at any moment. So don't worry. <laughs> oh, man. So yeah. we have Ted, we have Clarence, <laughs> and we have Lee. And then I just want to make sure everybody has a chance before we have to wrap yeah, up. Yeah, I, I need to make my dancers shorter. Okay. Uh, no, no, you're... you're I'd say my first job was started as a police reporter and uh, for the Tribune, and I've been interested kind of for a long time. It does seem to me the central question is not getting answered here, except accepting everything Tony says about um, the importance of the good chief. You have to answer the question, who is going to appoint the chief and how do you get people into the office, that office who are willing to do that? I'd like to get the answer to, I'd like to hear your answer to that question, Tony. Well, uh, before I answer it, let me just say, like once again, the most important institution in America is the free and untrammeled press, period. And, and there are so many people in public life that are at war with a free press that it just appalls me. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, as to your question, it's personal selection. Uh, sense of, what drives people to make a sensible selection? Well, crisis. And, uh, and we now have a crisis, but we haven't really begun to analyze the issue. The union, I mean, we're all liberals and we all love unions and we all love education. The police union has become an evil instrument in America, and, because, and they only exist now to, to uh, protect thumpers. That's what they do. Benefits and salary is over. That debate is gone. Uh, the, the wages are high. Benefits are tremendous. Nobody quits. And the competition to be cops is tremendous. You know, I had a... Uh, a secret plan. I thought that the cops in Minneapolis were so militant when I arrived that they would uh, strike. I thought there would, there would be a police strike. And uh, in 1919 in Boston, there was a police strike and I made the governor of Massachusetts president, Calvin Coolidge, and he fired all the cops. I had a plan to deal with a police strike. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of it. It's too boring, and I don't want to put certain people into a permanent uh, catatonic state. But the reality is uh, that it's, the, the same issue arises with government as arises with capitalism. What makes capitalism the most effective economic system ever developed by humans? Ruthlessness, competition accountability, bottom line, management, performance. That's what makes capitalism thrive. No, it's not benign. It's not charming or delightful. Uh, and it's not even hugely popular amongst the intelligentsia. But it creates wealth. It knows how to do it because of profit and loss and, and, and accountability. Well, the government is not capitalism. The government, you appoint people, they elect people. I mean, you have a country with uh, people, uh, enormously powerful people, McConnell, 
Ted Cruz. I mean, give me a break. Uh, you know, uh, democracy produces some troglodytes, some pretty awful people. So the reality is uh, that uh, you got to pick better people. Go, go. And the only reason, the only way we seem, seem to be able to do that is to have a horrifying crisis. So there you are. Can you be a little more candid in your answers, Tony? <laughs> yeah. A lifetime. Uh, my mother yeah. used to be terrified every time I opened my mouth. <laughs> uh, Clarence and Lee. The question I've got uh, revolves around, in part, the, the union management question, uh, the police contract. And uh, conventionally, in any, kind of con in any kind of a contract, there are two sides. There's the representatives of the laboring group and there are the representatives of management. And both sides have to come together to sign an agreement. We seem to have had over 20 some, 30 maybe years, of both sides seemingly a contract agreeing to all the processes for handling uh, the management of the police union, and not the union, but the police department. And anytime there were people who seemingly uh, went to extremes um, and the police chief tried to intervene, we had a process for uh, handling those things that could go on and on. Uh, what are your reflections on the management side of this agreement? What is it, how, do the, how does the city propose what it wants on the management side? And who are the signatures on the management side? Uh, and how do we get a public discussion of what it is that we expect from this agreement? It seems there's very little discussion about this at all. It just kind of happens. And it's gone on and on and on and on and on and on. I mean, there hasn't been any change at all, as far as I can see, in the process on the management side. What's your observations? Well, I, I think. Uh... I, I think people are just not knowledgeable enough. Uh, um, who knows anything about policing in America, really? Nobody does, really, uh, <laughs> myself included. Uh, uh, look, at the, look at the issues. Uh, uh, who wants to confront it? Uh, so would anybody in America say, in the, as I told the police chief here, your management, their labor is an adversarial relationship. You've got to fight the union. The only way to reform the police in America today that I can see is to fight the union. How do you eliminate a bloat, feather bedding? Why can't they have one person patrols? You immediately double the number of calls you can answer without increasing the number of cops. What does every police chief do in America? More, please, sir, more, right out of Dickens. That's all they ever asked for. You have a bloated, I, a bloated bureaucracy. I never asked for an additional cop, ever, anywhere. In three police agencies, through 11 rank levels, 13 books, 20 years of expert witness testimony, I never once asked for more cops. My job was to make the cops I had work faster, better, more efficiently. Their benefits were enormous. Their salaries are generous. Nobody quits. Make them work harder. Their morale rises when you make them work harder. That's what it's about. And nobody wants, sees it as a management problem. Uh, is there anyone, anyone here today that, that would say the... Uh, the Minneapolis Police Department is a bloated bureaucracy full of <laughs> all kinds of extraneous nonsense. Uh, they don't work eight-hour days. They don't work five-day weeks. They, what, uh, we're not talking uh, about going back to Dickens and, and oppressing laborers and sending them into the mines. We're talking about management, managing. It's a bloated bureaucracy full of uh, supervisors. Tell me what the mounted patrol, what possible use that is. Tell me why you have a public information officer. 
to massage the, uh, the information. Tell me why you have all those deputy chiefs. Uh, you know, in, in, this, in the 80s, Minneapolis had much more crime than it does today, thanks to a Minnesotan named Harry Blackman, who gave us Roe v. Wade and, and reduced the population of criminals in America enormously. I know it's a, it's a crazy thing to say, but it happens to be true. The reality is that uh, we one need to confront the issues. A bloat in the police department. There isn't a police department in America that is not a bloated, disgraceful, wasteful bureaucracy. Maybe not Camden. Okay, I hope not. So I'm going to jump in, then I see Lee, and then I want everybody else that maybe hasn't asked a question to jump in. Um, what about the, 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 what I see, Tony, is a complete lack of information and transparency. Uh, the union contract we talked about is never discussed in public. Uh, there are huge settlements, uh, $47 million in settlements in just two cases. They're all discussed behind closed doors. Uh, there's never any kind of after action report submitted as to why these things happened. Um, uh, our discipline process is incredibly uh, uh, private and secret. Uh, Chauvin himself uh, was never publicly disciplined. He might have been coached, but we, that is not public in Minneapolis. So there's this shroud of secrecy that surrounds uh, the process. I'm wondering what was that like when you were there and is part of the solution here to have to have no more abuse of the attorney-client privilege, discuss these settlements in public, discuss the union agreement in public, open up the doors uh, to this information. Would, would that make a difference? Bravo, Paul, bravo. Openness, transparency, truth, honesty, responsiveness. Tell people the truth, uh, even when it's hard. I said Roe v. Wade would reduce crime in America, and people said, and why? Because teenage, impoverished, Black, and Hispanic young women would not, would be aborted. Well, that makes you sound like a racist. You can't say that. Well, I did say it, and I wrote it in 1990, and I fought with the editor over it. Truth is hard. Transparency is hard. We, when I was chief and cops uh, did wrong, I announced their names and struggled with the uh, disciplinary issue. And I told people what was happening. And, and we had issues and we had uh, controversies. It was nine years and nine hard years, 1980, uh, the, the 80s. They were not easy years. Tell the American people the truth. Be transparent. Don't be secretive. You know what I told reporters? I didn't have a public information officer. You want any information, go ask. And if a cop doesn't want to talk to you, let me know. I once had an incident where a reporter called me and he said, we are at the site of, a, of a, the murder of an Indian woman it was a guy killer, a serial killer killing Indian women, big, big case. And the reporter and the cop refuses to speak to us. I said, put him on. Oh. So the lieutenant came on and said, Chief, uh, I can't comment on this case. It's an ongoing investigation, a sex crime. And, and there are issues that I cannot reveal. I said, tell that to the press. Yeah. So don't tell me. In other words, that's the kind of openness you need. You don't have to tell them everything. Yeah. Tell them you can't talk about it. It's confidential. It's an ongoing investigation. You don't want to reveal the identity of a sex victim. Terrific. Tell them that. Sure. That's the issue. So, so hard to do, right? So hard. Mm. Not hard. Openness, truthfulness. We've just been through a president who, who characteristically and viscerally was incapable of telling the truth. Well, you saw where that, where that led to, uh, the beginnings of an autocracy. 
the beginning of the end of democracy. That's what I saw. It. And uh, openness, accountability, transparency, yes. And as to the press, don't have a press information officer. Every member of the department speaks to the press. So what? Hmm. Now How's you get disciplined. Awful? Now you get disciplined for doing that. So. Yeah. Paul. This just happened. I, I, Janice is, is yes, Paul. I want to give, who, I'm sorry, who's that? This is T. Uh, get, T, uh, you go I'll, ahead, and then Janice. I want to give yeah. folks a chance that haven't jumped in yet. I'm sorry, I've done okay. too much. Uh, but, uh, uh, Janice and T, and then and then Clarence and Lee. Yeah, well, uh, good morning, Tony. Good to see you. Good to see you, T. Yeah, well, you know, you, you mentioned the point about uh, crises and that we, uh, uh, we tend to, uh, that, that crisis drives change. But we have a, a tendency here uh, not to look back at how we responded to our various crises to see whether or not we can learn anything from that. And we've had enough crises in here that involve uh, around the police and other kinds of issues that we, if we carefully examine what we did at the time, look at where we made good uh, decisions and where we made poor decisions, we might learn something from that that would guide us through uh, our current crisis. Uh, you know, how, how, what, what do you think about that? Well, I'm not sure I understood the question, T. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that, that we, 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 we tend not to look at our history, history of response to our various crises. We start all over again and trying to figure out how we're going to deal with the current crisis without looking for lessons that we may have learned from previous crises. You know, the, it's a very complicated and you know, difficult question and, and a good one. Look at the reality. White America has subjected and suppressed and oppressed Black America to the point of poverty. Well, how do you escape poverty? Oh, yeah, there are very few ways to escape poverty you know, when you're oppressed and there is no way out. Drugs, alcohol, crime, protest, anger, exclusion. That has been the role of the Black in America uh, very largely. Uh, and who do you, so you have to hire somebody to control that. Well, who do you hire to control Black criminality, drug addiction, alcohol, escape into desperation? Uh, you, you, you hire cops to control them. Uh, a wonderfully emblematic case was the case of the Central Park murder, Christian Cooper. Black man watch, looking at birds in Central Park. A woman lets a dog loose. He says the dog should not be unleashed, a white woman. The dog should not be unleashed. <clears throat> She said, I'm going to call the police. She calls the police. They respond. They behave sensibly. Christian Cooper handled it brilliantly, black male. He was responsible, intelligent, in control, intellectually coping, totally superior. <clears throat> he controlled that situation. The woman even lost the dog. The adoption agency took it back. She was <laughs> fired from her job. She, when she called 911, it was taped. And she said, I'm being menaced by a black male and uh, respond immediately. My life is in danger. Christian Cooper, who is he? The black hero of this transaction. Huh. Harvard graduate. Harvard, the Ivy League, that's the answer. Send every black male in America to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or or St. <Saint> Olaf. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good segue for you, Janice. Okay. Uh, well, I just, what a lot we've covered today, and I want to thank you so deeply. And in our last, we just have a moment or two, I see. Is there anything you'd like to 
that we haven't covered that you'd like to say to the 8,500 people we send this interview to, uh, that would just help them understand, and learn. Yes. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This is a blessed country. Well, I've lived in others. Believe me, we have something precious here. You better cling to it. Yeah. God bless America. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.